Today we're going to be attempting to go through Psalms 88 and 89. You notice that I've said attempt because the first psalm that we'll be looking at only has 18 verses. The second psalm has 52. And uh, anyway, we're going to try and go through both of them. And that means that I'm going to probably just touch on things and not give as much detail as I might normally do as I go through my studies with you. Uh, the first portion, the first psalm, uh, Psalm 88, though, only has 18 verses. And let's see how we can do on this one first, and then we'll move into Psalm 89. Beginning at verse 1, Psalm 88, uh, the psalmist writes, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves, Selah. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I'm shut up, and I cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Selah. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But to you I have cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came around me all day long like water. They engulfed me altogether. Loved one and friend you have put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. Now we will look at this cheery psalm. As we look at it, let's begin by, by noting that it is obviously what is called a song of lamentation, a song of sorrow. It's a song that, it's a song that has been written from the depths of grief from somebody who is turning to the Lord God for his help. That's what we're looking at here. It's a psalm that has been written by the sons of Korah. And what we really see here, I think, is humanity. We're really seeing an honest cry. We're seeing the cry of a believer who is going through difficult times. As a matter of fact, he makes it very clear that this has been something that has been prolonged in his life. If you noted verse 15, he said, I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. So this is something that the psalmist has been going through for some time, through most of their life. And yet in spite of all of this, he's crying out to the Lord. In spite of what he has gone through, he's trusting God, and he believes that the Lord is going to eventually deliver him. And so he begins this psalm in verses 1 and 2 by saying, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. So he's making it very clear that he is continually crying out, and he's doing so loudly for help. He's praying fervently and constantly that the Lord might hear what he has to say. James tells us that the fervent and effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And he's speaking from a heart that says, Lord, I have cried out so loudly, and I desire that you would hear me because I am filled with troubles. Notice verse 3, my soul is full of troubles. My life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more and who are cut off from your hand. Though I am physically alive, yet my life feels like it is slowly but surely draining out of me. I am losing my strength, and I'm losing my desire to live, and I'm crying out to you because I feel like I have been abandoned. And I know that there are some in this room who would understand what he's saying. There are some in this room who have cried out to the Lord in your time of affliction, in your time of sorrow. Some of us in this room who might have gone through some hard times from the time we were young. 
And yet I want you to notice that even though he's saying my soul is full of troubles, yet he is demonstrating something. He's demonstrating faith and trust in the Lord by even calling out to him. Because there are numbers of people who, when they cry out to God, and if he doesn't answer quickly and doesn't do what they're asking, there are numbers of people who Im immediately just abandon any faith that they might have in God. Well, this psalmist isn't doing that. He's saying, I feel abandoned. He's saying, I feel like I've been uh, left uh, adrift among the dead. In other words, I'm like an unknown soldier who has been buried in a common grave. It's as if you don't even know that I exist. I feel that way, and yet I'm crying out to you. He says in verse 6, You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. You have afflicted me with all your waves. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I am shut up. I cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. I'm going through so much, he's saying, and I recognize your hand in the midst of all of this. And yet, I haven't abandoned faith in you. I trust you. I know that my relationship with you is solid, and I'm not going to turn away from you. I will not forsake you. It's obvious that genuine faith may occasionally wrestle with the Lord, and in our, in our, our wrestling with the Lord, it's, it's okay to ask Him questions. Uh, there have been times in my life where I have where I've said, Lord, uh, I know that your will for me is good, and I know that you have everything perfectly in control, and, and I trust you in that. And yet, at the same time, if you don't mind, I, I would like to ask you, why is this going on? Can you give me some direction? Can you give me a glimmer of hope? Can you give me some insight? Can you lead me? Can you open my eye? Lord, I'm looking at your word. Would you speak to me? And that's basically what he's doing here. He recognizes it's the hand of the Lord upon him, and he recognizes he's going through these things because it's gone through the will of God for his life. And that's what he's saying here. Notice how he says, you've laid me in the lowest pit. He says, you have afflicted me. You have put away my acquaintances. In other words, I'm boxed in. I'm, I'm without encouragement from anyone. I feel forsaken. I feel forsaken by you, and I feel forsaken by man. When he says, my eye wastes away because of affliction, that's another way of saying I've cried myself to the point where I'm almost going blind from my tears. I'm crying like that. I'm wasting away. He goes on to say in verse 9, Lord, I have I've called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. I've reached out to you, and I'm crying out, and I'm saying, Lord, uh, without you, I'm, I'm not going to make it. It reminds me of what the psalmist said in Psalm 6, verses 2 and 3 where he said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My, my soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? When are you going to move on my behalf? I know that you will, but I'm certainly asking that it may be soon. James, in chapter 5 in the New Testament, uh, verse 11, James said, Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. We will go through things sometimes that when it begins and even in the middle of it, we may feel that we're all alone. We may feel that, that the Lord isn't aware of our situation, which obviously He always is. But we may also feel that we've been abandoned by those who should be with us. But if we can only remember that God is good, God loves us, and God never forsakes us, and that the end result is going to be worth the journey, then that will encourage us while we're in the midst of all of this. He says to us in verse 10, Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Selah. Selah means think about that. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of for forgetfulness? From his perspective, and I want you to see this, he's aware of the fact that death is not something that is to be desired. And that's because believers celebrate life. I can still remember when, uh, when uh, Eastern religion began to infiltrate the thought processes of the average American 
which has taken place in our generation. It's taken place within the last 20 to 30 years. When Eastern philosophy began to be accepted as being kind of normal, which uh, all of my young people in here have grown up thinking that Eastern thought, Eastern religion, and Eastern techniques of, of faith are pretty much normal and have always been here, but those of us who are older would say, no, that's not true. That that's, that's come about in the last 20 or 30 years, especially in the last 10 years. I mean, the YMCA, for example, the YMCA stands for Young Men's Christian Association. It originally was established to evangelize, bring people into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what the YMCA used to do. And I found it interesting to note that now many YMCAs offer yoga and various other Eastern meditative uh, things like that, and they have basically infiltrated to the point that, that many Christians are involved in Eastern thought and Eastern mysticism. Many who profess Christ are, are thinking that, that's, that they're compatible and all. Uh, but that's something that's really new. And in the Eastern infiltration of the way Americans think, the idea that, that death actually is a door that leads you to something better. And some even go so far as speaking of death as being a friend. And that's really not a Christian way to think at all. In the Old Testament and in the New, death is perceived of, recognized as, and declared to be an enemy. It isn't looked at as being a friend. And so the psalmist here is speaking of death in that way. And that's the reason why he's saying here, will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark, your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? He's saying that death, and that's what he's saying, if I die, that's what's going to happen. Is there, is there any glory in that? Now, in the New Testament... In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, you might want to note this. The Bible says the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So death is not looked at as being a friend in the Bible. It's actually declared to be an enemy. And so because God is the God of life, and because God in his promises in the Old Testament declared to the people, if you do this, you shall live, and because he's a God who blesses, he's a God of covenant in the Old Testament, then the psalmist naturally would say, what profit is there in death? I would remain alive to praise you because life is your gift to me. Notice in verse 13, but to you I have cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I've been afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came around me all day long like water. They engulfed me altogether. Loved one and friend you have put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. And so he's speaking concerning that and making it very clear that in his particular situation, all he can do is continue to cry out. He says in verse 13, I have cried out, O Lord. I have cried out to you, in other words, in faith. My crying out reveals that I believe in you and that I need you. And I haven't grown weary as I've cried out to you. I do so regularly. I rise up early and I call unto you. Because my greatest struggle seems to simply be, why is this happening to me and I need you to answer me? In Psalm 77, verses 7 through 9, will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? There have been times in my walk with the Lord um, where I have come to the point where I have cried out like that. And I know that some in this room can say that too. You go to bed at night crying out to the Lord, God, when are you going to move on my behalf? And you have a troubled night of sleep because you have no peace. Then you wake up the next morning and you begin your day by crying out again to the Lord. God, is this the day that you're going to set me free? I was speaking to somebody today who called me up, a fellow pastor. He's going through a circumstance situation and we had a long talk, about an hour we spoke. And that's kind of what I was sharing with him today when I was saying to him in his situation, I was saying, you know, the key, the bottom line is the fact that, uh, that God loves you, that God's working through you, God is faithful to you, and he's going to bring you through all of this. And he's going to be exalted. 
And all we need to do is trust Him. All we need to do is hold on to Him. All we need to do is just believe Him. See, that's where a lot of us come into our problems because, um, well, like Jeremiah, sometimes we say to the Lord, I'd like to talk to you concerning your judgments. In other words, Lord, you know, the way you're running the universe really isn't pleasing to me at the moment, and I would like to give you some instruction. You know, actually, I do live here. I kind of have some inside knowledge, and if you'd only do things my way, I'd feel a lot better. Well, sometimes we, uh, we go to bed at night and we give the, the, the Lord instructions. We wake up in the morning, do the same thing. The bottom line is, is uh, what I have to do is quiet myself, trust him, and know that what I'm seeing occur right now isn't the end. It isn't the final. It's part of the process. I've said it like this before. I, as a parent, I have my children, and my children have their lives. They have their testimonies, and I see their lives as being like a book. And there are times when I'm looking at the book, and it's a, you know, the chapter I'm reading right now may be a comedy, and sometimes the chapter in their life is a tragedy. And sometimes it's uh, your know, romance or whatever. It's their book. It's the book of their life. And, and there are times when I'm reading their life and I'm saying, I'm not quite sure whether they're going to make it through. I'm not sure whether they're walking with the Lord. I'm not sure what's going to happen. The Lord very often has reminded me simply by saying, you haven't gotten to the last chapter yet. You know, the book is still being written. You haven't gotten to the conclusion yet. It will be good. But you have to wait to that conclusion, you see? And my life is the same way. There are times in my life that's a tragedy. Sometimes there's a comedy. Sometimes there's a romance. Sometimes there's something going on that's mysterious. That's my life. But the end will always be good. So it's good because God has a plan for my life. He has a plan for yours too. So you cry out to the Lord, and you ask God for help. And you say to the Lord, I need you. Even though, as we see in verses 15 through 18, he's been afflicted for a long time. Even though he says, I've suffered for a long time, even though I've been engulfed by trouble, and even though I'm tired, I've lost my loved ones, I've lost my dearest friends, and I right now feel like I'm in darkness, yet I have come to one conclusion. I've come to believe that I can trust you, and I will continue to pray to you. And that's really going to be the bottom line. Even though the last verse here, verse 18, is kind of like a, a downer, really. It's negative. Loved one and friend you have put far from me, my acquaintance into darkness. Bang, it's over. We need to go back to the first verse when he says, O Lord God of my salvation, I've cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer, prayer um, come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. It's actually a prayer of hope, even though it may end up seeming like, he'd, like he concludes it in a negative way. When we, uh, when we finished building this particular structure, many of you remember this, when we finished building this, uh, this sanctuary and we were about to, to uh, carpet, some of you were with us when I said, why don't you come on Saturday? And if you have a heart verse, a scripture that the Lord has given to you that, that, that is special to you, why don't you come and why don't you write that scripture here on the, uh, on the platform because we didn't have any carpet on it, and this is all concrete. And so I came out with my spray paint and wrote little David, did she know? Um, <laughs> we all came out and we had our pens. And, uh, and we have on this platform here where I to remove the carpet all the way down the steps. Everywhere on this platform, there's scripture, everywhere. And, and that was to remind me and to remind those who did that that this fellowship is built on the Word of God. I am literally standing in a literal sense. I am literally standing on the Word of God right now because I have scriptures right underneath me that cover my whole area here. My family actually wrote their scriptures right here where I stand. I wrote that, that, that Jesus Christ is a sure foundation right here. That's where I'm standing, right over the scripture that I wrote. And my mom said, because my mom lives in, in New Mexico, my mom said, would you please write the scripture that belonged to your father and me? And, and this was the scripture that I wrote for my mom. It's Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. It's right here where I'm standing. And it simply says, though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Lord God is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. 
And my mom had that scripture because that was her scripture with my father. And my mom was going through the loss of my father who had recently passed on and gone to be with the Lord. But that's the way it is. Though everything around us looks like it's going downhill, yet God strengthens us through those things and enables us to be victorious. And how does that take place? Well, in this particular psalm, even though he said, my soul is full of troubles, still I cry out to you all day long, and I know my hope is in you. And that's a cry of faith, though it may look like despair. Now we look at Psalm 89, beginning at verse 1. And I won't read all 52 verses. I'll just begin at verse 1 and read 51. No, I'll, I'll just read a couple of them and we'll get into it. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Selah. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For when the heavens can be compared to the Lord, who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm." So he begins in the first two verses by simply saying, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. The writer of this particular psalm is a man named Ethan. He was a Levitical worship leader mentioned in 1 Chronicles 15, 19, as well as 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 31. He was a contemporary of King David. And as he writes this psalm, it's a prayer that God will honor his covenant with the king. When he says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord, notice with me he begins with praise for God's love and for God's mercy, and he also is praising Lord, the Lord for all that he has done and his faithfulness. And he's making it very clear that this is right to do so because God is worthy to receive our praise. The Bible tells us in Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And so because he is worthy, the psalmist cannot help but speak out about him. Notice with me, he says in verse 1, with my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Listen, if you want to be a witness, and I know that some people in this room might say, you know, that's the one thing I'd like to be able to do. I'd like to be able to share my faith. I don't know how to do that. You can go to every How to Give Away Your Faith class that any church offers. You can begin to memorize Scripture. There are various things you can do. There are various ways that you can do that. They have different methods. You know, they have the four spiritual laws, or they have a technique called the Roman road. There are various ways that you can begin to memorize Scriptures. You can have mock debates with people where they ask you questions, and then you come up with the answer. There are a variety of things you can do. You can be taken door to door by somebody who's experienced in street witnessing. You can stand on street corners. You can open your mouth up with a bullhorn and you can yell at people as they go by. You can do a variety of things. You can be with people who have done that. But let me tell you the simplest way to become a witness. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. That's, that's how. It's, it's so simple. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. When you spend time with the Lord in prayer, when you spend time with the Lord in His Word, when you spend time with those who love the Lord, you're going to be a witness. Now, Jesus Christ taught us, ye shall be witnesses of me. He said, after you see the Holy Spirit, you shall be witnesses of me. He didn't say you shall do witnessing. He said you shall be witnesses. And what happens is God transforms your life so that whenever you have opportunity and people ask a question concerning the hope that lies within you, because you've been in the Word of God, because you've been fellowshipping with the Lord in prayer, because you have friends who love Jesus and you speak about Him amongst yourself, it's a very natural thing for you to just talk about the Lord. Everybody in this room who is part of this ministry probably knows that my wife's name is Marie, 
Probably everybody here knows that. If you don't, my wife's name is Marie. Um, why am I saying that? Well, because there are times that I have opportunity to go other places, other states. You know, I've been, you know, just name it. I've been, you know, Chicago. I've been to, to, to Miami. You name it. I've been to various places. And very often when I've gone to these places to do ministry, very often I've had people I've never met in my life walk up to me and say, Hi, Pastor David. Where's Marie? And I'll say, Well, she's home. And how are the kids? How's Corinne? How's David? How's Joseph? How's Anna doing? And I'll say, They're doing fine. Do you know my family? Yes, I do. Oh, really? How'd you meet them? Through you on the radio. You talk about them all the time. And that's the truth. But do I have in my notes right here? Talk about Marie after verse 2. No, I don't have that. You know what happens, guys? It's just part of my life. It's just natural for me to do that. I don't even think about that. You might find this interesting. I won't bore you too long, but just another moment if you don't mind. Um, I get asked fairly often from outside churches and organizations if I will teach on the family. And, and that is not my favorite subject. That is not my favorite subject to speak on. I'm not really inclined towards that. And I'll say, why? You know, well, because it's obvious you love yours. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And when you are in love with the Lord, even as he says, with my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. He's simply saying, Lord, I'm singing of your mercies, and I want people to know about you. It's that simple, guys. It's that simple. All you need to do is fall in love with the Lord. Spend time with him. He's worthy to be praised. Spend time with him. Because when you love him, you read his Bible. When you read the word, you memorize it. When you memorize it, you have it in your heart. When you begin to speak, it comes out. And you might even blow your own mind sometimes at the things you say. You might be speaking, and it's flowing so naturally, you're saying to yourself, Man, this is good. You know, I'm better than Greg Laurie. I, I am so good. You know, because it comes out. It flows so naturally. You see, it's really not that difficult. So he says, I have said in verse 2, I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. In verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant, David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. A couple of things I want to point out in verses 3 and 4. I want you to notice that David here, this is King David. King David is being referred to as God's chosen as well as God's servant. And as the king, it was his responsibility to execute God's will on earth. That's why he'd be referred to as his servant. I also want to note to you that uh, he didn't say, my leader, David. As a matter of fact, you might find this interesting. It's very practical. You might find this interesting to note that when the Lord begins to speak about those that he uses, he normally speaks of them as his servant. He'll speak of his, his servant Abraham. He just saw him speak of his servant David. Because what God wants to do is God wants to use you as his servant to do works for him. And so that's what he's speaking about. As a servant, it's his responsibility to execute God's will on earth. Now, notice he speaks of a covenant here, a covenant that he has made with David. He says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. See, King David was given a promise by God. And that promise, if you take notes, is recorded in 2 Samuel. In chapter 7, verses 12, 13, and 16. And the promise went like this. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 16, your house, your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. That was a promise that was made to King David that was fulfilled in a descendant by the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the son of David. 
In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it speaks of the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. So that promise to King David was fulfilled in his, in his descendant or his seed, Jesus Christ. That's what he means in verse 4, your seed I will establish forever. The seed he's speaking of is his descendant, his descendant being Jesus, and build up your throne to all generations. Jesus is one who rules and reigns forever. Verse 5, the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. Rahab is another name for Egypt. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. And notice he's speaking of how the heavens will praise the Lord. The angels and all that has been created uh, will recognize that God has established David as king. Um, and notice with me in verses 6 as well as verse 8 that no created being, including angels, are like the Lord God. In verses 9 and 10, he speaks of the God ruling the raging of the sea. In other words, God is sovereign over nature, and God establishes the nations. And he shows his great power in his deliverance of his people. He did so when he delivered them from Egypt. He does so when he delivers us from sin. So he demonstrates his great power in his, in his conquering, if you will, of nature, in his ruling over it. That's what verse 9 says, you rule the raging of the sea. Now, we, re we remember in Mark's gospel, in chapter 4, how that there's a, a certain incident in the ministry life of Jesus Christ. And let me read it to you. It's found in Mark 4, verses 35 through 41, where Mark said, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him, and, great wind, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Now think about that for just a moment. Even the wind and the sea obey him. So when you leave tonight and it's pouring and you stand out there in the parking lot and you say, cease, be still. If it stops, I'll follow you to the end of the earth. I don't think it will. <laughs> but Jesus could do that and Jesus did do that. And so he's pointing out, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you. Verse 11, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours. The world in all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, which are two mountains there in Israel, rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk. O oh Lord, in the light of your countenance, in your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, and our King to the Holy One of Israel. So he praises God because God is the God of the entire earth. God is the one who created all things. Remember with me that the pagan religions during this time of the writing of this psalm believed that there were territorial gods. And they even divided the, the cosmos. They divided it into various, various uh, levels and all. So you might have a god under the earth. You had a god on the earth. You had a god above the earth. And what he's simply saying here is that the god that we worship is the god of the whole earth, the whole universe. Everything is under him. Psalm 24, verse 1 says it this way, The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. And so he's making it very clear that everything belongs to the Lord. In verses 14 through 18, when he speaks of righteousness and justice being the foundation of his throne, not only is God mighty, he is righteous, just, merciful, and he is filled with truth. 
and there is no evil, nor is there any injustice in his rule. The result, obviously, when you have a God like that, is people are blessed, people are filled with joy, people are protected, and they end up praising him. In verse 19 following, he goes on to say, Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. Also, my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. So David is recognized here as the anointed one of God. He's the one who has been anointed by God that he might become a warrior. And notice how he says that God gave David wisdom so that no enemy could outwit him or have a lasting victory over him. It's God's anointing that gave him strength, and it's God's anointing that gives him wisdom over all of his foes. Obviously, this picture is fulfilled perfectly in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, very briefly, I would remind you that we New Testament believers who have received the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and I've been, I've been wanting to say this as often as possible to remind us as a congregation concerning this, I would remind you, and, and perhaps some of you are, are just learning this right now, that the Holy Spirit anointing in your life gives to you power from above. God's Holy Spirit filling you uh, gives you a strength, and God gives you wisdom through His Word. Uh, one of the scriptures that is dear to me is where the Lord uh, makes it very clear that, that He will give you words and He will give you wisdom that none of your enemies can gainsay nor resist. God gives to us through the power of His Holy Spirit wisdom from above and a confidence and a courage to speak. And, uh, and you may say, is that true? And the answer obviously is yes. Because when I first got saved at the age of 20, if you would have told me the day before I got saved, if you'd have told me the day before I got saved that one day my life would be filled with standing in front of people giving, quote-unquote, book reports or lectures, I'd have thought you were crazy. I'd have said, you've got to be kidding me. You're telling me that one day my whole life will be standing in front of people talking? The number one fear of every American, when it's there are surveys done all the time, the number one fear, the thing that we have the most fear of doing, is speaking in front of people. I wonder how many of you, now I'm sure I have a few here who like to, but I wonder how many of you were the kind who would raise your hand real high when the teacher said, can somebody come and write on the board? And you just would walk up there, I'm sure, and you had your hair parted very nicely, I'm sure, you know, and everything. You were just so, so cute. But most of us would fold our arms. If the teacher said, anybody know the answer to this question? Most of us would just kind of fold our arms, at least my friends, and we would just kind of pretend that we weren't even listening to what the teacher was saying. How about you, Rosales? Do you want to say anything? And I'd kind of look at him and I'd just... He's not talking to me. There's no way I'm going to say anything. No way. You know, and my friends, most of my friends were that way. There were very few people who would stand up there and work that, that problem out for the teacher in front of everybody. There's just this fear that we have of doing that. I remember when I was in the seventh grade, and I was one of these kids that was supposed to grow more, and I didn't. So I was very small. So my mom, you know, this is a day, some of you, this is ancient history, uh, bear with me. Some of you might remember this or, or understand this. We didn't have all kinds of clothes that we bought for the first day of school. We had like two pairs of pants for me, maybe a pair of shoes and a couple of shirts. And that was going to last most of the year. We weren't out there constantly buying clothes. That's basically what you have. And so I'm entering into the seventh grade, and my mom went out with me to go, you know, shopping for school. We used to call it school shopping, school clothes shopping. And, and she would buy me clothes that I was going to grow into. And so, you know, those clothes. And so they ne I never did. And so I can still remember I had this pair of Levi's. And during that day, white Levi's were very, very cool. And so I asked my mom, could I get some white Levi's? Well, we couldn't get Levi's, so we ended up getting Lee jeans, and they were white. So I was already uncool because I wore Lee's when everybody else was wearing Levi's. But beyond that, they were so big that I had to cuff them, 
And then I pulled my belt so that all the belt loops were all cinched up, so they were all bunched up. I looked like the perfect nerd, you know, with the pocket protector and all of those things. That was, you know, my hair was greased in a certain way, and I had glasses that my head was supposed to grow into. And so, and, and, and they didn't. And I had somebody call me, I don't know if you even remember this one, Superfly, Superfly with these big old glasses like that. And I can still remember, you know, the pants were so big that I just didn't fill them out. So I would go into the, into the bathroom and I would get you know, hand, uh, you know, paper towels and I'd fold them up and I'd put them in my back pocket to try and add some substance to me. And, and, uh, and I, man, it was just anything I did not want to do is stand in front of people. There's just no way. I, I can still remember I was in a class when the teacher said, David, come on up and, and, and fill out this, you know, fix this, you know, solve this problem. Oh, I had to walk from the back of the room, and as I'm walking, I, my pockets are bulging with paper, and I've got these, you know, and I remember standing there at the, at the board when a guy named Mike O'Heron, Mike O'Heron, how I hate him to this day, uh, Mike O'Heron, <laughs> yells out, look at how big his pants are. And I almost died. I was so embarrassed. I turned beet red. Look at them pants. They were so big. You know, who wants to stand in front of people? Who wants to do that? And when I got saved, the Lord said, that's what you're going to do. The only way that I can do that, the only way, you know, and I'll give you a second thing if you don't mind. Um, you will not believe this, those of you who only know me from the pulpit. I am very quiet, shy, reserved, and I am not the kind of person who tells you anything about myself if it's just you and me talking. You will not know a thing about me. I'm very closed, very closed. I did not cry. My wife never saw me cry until I started being a pastor preaching, and before you know it, my eyes would well with tears when I would speak. That is not me. Down there, I'm just as macho as any other person you've ever met, maybe even more so, maybe even more so. But God has a way of saying, you know what? You're reserved, you're quiet, you like to keep your opinions basically to yourself or amongst a cluster of close friends. I'm going to take you, and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to anoint you, and I'm going to give you the opportunity, the privilege, and the joy of speaking to groups of people for the rest of your life. That comes to the Holy Spirit. That comes to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that you covet so that you can have for the attention that you might gain. It's that God works in you like Jeremiah, when Jeremiah said, uh, I had chosen not to say anything, but I couldn't keep my mouth shut. Your word was like a fire burning in me, and I had to speak. And that's what happens. And that's how the work of the Lord goes forth. And so he understands that, that God is working in him and, and has anointed him. And, and it's the anointing of David where he says in verse 20, I found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him. It's a picture of the anointing that took place in the life of the king but is perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, David's, when it says in verse 21, my arm shall strengthen him, you receive power from the Lord, and God is the one who holds you up and strengthens you. No enemy shall outwit him. There are times that you can speak that none, like I said, none of your enemies can gain, say, no resist. You're speaking words of wisdom that come from heaven. Verse 24, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name his horn shall be exalted. Also I will set his hand over the sea. And his right hand over the rivers, he shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep, him, uh, keep for him forever. My covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. And so uh, basically all he's saying is God is faithful. God is faithful to his promises, and his love ensures that promises are kept and, and the glory that God will bestow will be recognized by all nations. Again, this promise is completely fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 30, if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will visit their transgression with the rod, their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly, utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. 
My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever, like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. So obviously he's speaking of David in here, and he's saying, uh, he's answering the question, what happens if the children of the covenant sin? And God gives them a promise. God promises to chastise them. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 8, verse 5, uh, the Lord said, Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Proverbs 3.12 says, If the Lord disciplines those he loves, the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. And so the Lord has a way of disciplining, and that's what he does if you are in sin. He does discipline you. Verse 38 but you have cast off and abhorred. You have been furious with your anointed. You have renounced the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him. He's a reproach to his neighbors. You've exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in the battle. You have made his glory cease, cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth you have shortened. You have covered him with shame, Selah. So he cries out here. And in essence, what he's doing is he's, he's reiterating what has happened to, to the people when they've been chastened, but he's also crying out for mercy. You see, God had made promises to be merciful, and it seems sometimes that he's forgotten those promises. The people are undergoing affliction. So he's crying out to God, and he's saying, show us mercy. You see, in God's anger, sometimes it appears that God has dis disregarded his promise. It seems that God has cast off, that God has rejected, that God has been furious, that God has renounced, and even allowed enemies to triumph. So in this, he's greatly saddened. And you see that as we read this, because the enemies now rejoice. And so he's saying, it seems, Lord, that you've forsaken your people and forgotten your promises. So, verse 46, how long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what futility have you created all the children of men? What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? Lord, where are your former loving kindnesses, which you swore to David in your truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples with which your enemies have reproached you, O Lord, with which they have reproached the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. And so he's saying we are near death. We're feeling utterly forsaken. It seems as if you're going to leave us without help, and I don't have much time. And Lord, without your help, I know that I'm going to perish. But I need your loving kindnesses. You see, because without you, I'm not going to be able to survive. There are two scriptures the Lord gave to me that I combined that help me to understand what he's saying. Without you, I can't survive. Let me give you those scriptures and we'll close. One is when Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the other is when Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. One of the things that we need to understand is without him, we are helpless, but with him, we are victorious. I keep that in mind in my walk with the Lord. I keep that in mind, and I do so on a daily basis. I, I keep that in mind because I, I am one of those men who, who knows that the Lord does chasten those whom he loves. And for me, I, I really don't like spankings, never really did, never really enjoyed them, you know, and... Uh, you know, I normally tried to learn the lesson the first time it was being taught to me, or I tried real hard not to get caught the second time. I don't like getting spanked. I never did, and I, and I, and I know that the Lord spanks me even to this day. And so I've come to believe two things, what I just said. One is that without Jesus, I can do nothing, but with him, I can do all things. And so even in the times of chastening, it causes us to turn our eyes back to the Lord. Even in the times of him, of him spanking us, because we are his children, uh, it causes us to turn our eyes back to the Lord. And I want to learn the lesson the first time he speaks it to me. 
I don't want him to be repeating the same lessons over and over through a lifetime. And so the psalmist here is simply saying some very basic things. He's saying, Lord, you had promises that you made to David that are absolutely fulfilled in the descendant we know as Messiah Jesus. There are times when it seems that you're not listening to what we have to say, and I've discovered it's because there are times that you need to chasten. But I've come to understand through those chastenings that I need your kindness in my life. If you will give me your kindness, I will survive, triumph, and be blessed. And so I turn to you, and I ask you to forgive me and to bless me because I want to be used by you. Now, that's good advice. It's something that all of us ought to take. Let's pray.